Welcome, chefs, to our second World Chocolate Masters Tomorrow podcast. Today's podcast is all about the quest for the perfect ganache. For generations, ganache recipes haven't changed that much. Chocolate, cream and butter have played the lead roles in creating the right recipes. Until now, during the last 10 years, different visions, technologies and approaches have been brought to the table by pioneering chocolatiers to make ganaches lighter, less sweet, healthier and make the natural flavors of the cacao variety stand out all while trying to keep a commercially viable shelf life and keeping the ganache in top condition during its shelf life. Let's fly to Chicago and connect with our central guest of today's podcast, Chocolate Academy lead chef Dimitri Fayard. Diving into the miniature world of bonbons. Hi, I'm Dimitri Fayard. Today, I'm in the Chocolate Academy in Chicago, working on a few ganache recipes for molded and enrolled bonbon that will be part of our future course. Personally, I've always been intrigued by the little universe of the bonbon, simply because as a chef chocolatier, you're always on the quest to create a unique, memorable experience in something so small and precious as a bonbon. In the last 10 years, some pioneer chocolatiers have taken the bonbon to the next level by balancing out their recipe and applying new techniques. Their goal? bringing out all the natural flavor, reducing the sugar, the cream, and the butter, and making the bonbon lighter and more permissible. Today, I'm reaching out to those pioneers. Let's hear it from Wilfried Owl, a chef colleague working in the Chicago Academy in Russia, and Alexandre Bordeaux, a former colleague and now working as an independent chocolate and pastry consultant around the world. Let's explore ganaches. Wilfried and Alexandre, welcome to a World Chocolate Master Tomorrow podcast. I'm very happy to have you guys here. And let's start with a big question first. What is a ganache? And even more important, what is an ideal ganache to you? Merci Dimitri de m'avoir invité à cette conversation basée sur la ganache. Pour répondre à ta question, je vais diviser... Well, Dimitri, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Now, to answer your question, I always prefer to divide ganaches into two families. The first family is the pastry ganaches. We use these to make ice cream or mousses, for instance. The second family is the confectionery ganaches. And there we need to make a distinction between two varieties, sugar confectionery and chocolate confectionery. If a ganache contains more fats and sugars than chocolate, then we call it a sugar confectionery. If it contains mainly chocolate, then it qualifies as a chocolate confectionery. And now to precisely define a chocolate confectionery ganache, it is composed of dry ingredients, water and fats, which are dispersed in the ganache and therefore in suspension. But, and this might sound a bit shocking, which are not emulsified. Emulsionnés, c'est simplement une dispersion. Excellent. Well, Dimitri, of course, this is a, a question that, uh, you know, many people uh, ask me, you know, uh, during the past uh, 15 uh, years. For me, uh, ganache, uh, if, I, if I would say more personally, it's uh, a big part of uh, my life. But here, I think, you know, the answer that you are looking for, it's more specifically, what uh, is a ganache? So a ganache, it's an uh, emulsion and a suspension uh, between liquid uh, fat and uh, solid. So basically, we uh, we can imagine, you know, a combination, you know, of a liquid which can be a cream, for instance, okay, uh, together with a uh, chocolate and uh, some sugar. We are uh, giving. We are going to give uh, a very good and stable emulsion okay and if we look at you know at this product you know with a microscope okay we can see a perfect distribution of water fat and uh, solid and this is what makes let's say a ganache uh, uh, stable and a perfect uh, uh, product what we are looking for wilfried even more important what is the ideal ganache to you my response is sur le... well the ideal ganache really depends on the point of view for a consumer, the ideal ganache is all about character, taste and pleasure when trying it. For a professional, it's way more complex and other criteria come into play. 
The way the ganache is produced, for instance, the price, the application and the shelf life, they will determine how a professional sees the ideal ganache. Finalement, de conservation du produit. To answer your second question, uh, what is uh, for me the ideal uh, ganache or the, the best ganache? Well, for me, you know, again, I talk about uh, emotion, you know, uh, a product that uh, will bring me uh, emotion, uh, pleasure, and forgettable uh, moment. And that's uh, very, you know, the, the most important thing uh, for me. Um, Definitely uh, a ganache, you know, when I make, you know, my uh, personal ganache, the first thing that I will look at it, you know, it's a, a true taste. It's the flavor of uh, my ganache, okay? I won't play uh, first the whole expertise, you know, but I will really look uh, to have the real taste. If I make, for instance, uh, a passion fruit ganache, my uh, passion fruit ganache must have a real taste of passion fruit combined with uh, chocolates. Then second, uh, for me, uh, mouth feel, okay, which is a very important mouth feel. It's really, you know, the melting behavior, you know, uh, when you uh, eat uh, this uh, uh, ganache, okay? And of course, the last uh, point for me, you know, uh, for the perfect ganache, it's a ganache that has a, a real character. I just mentioned about, you know, passion fruit ganache, you know, if the passion fruit is really weak for me, it's not a successful ganache. Now, let's deep dive into the role of a ganache in a bonbon. What should he really do in a bonbon? What do you expect of a great ganache? Une bonne ganache, le ganache idéal est une ganache. For me, a good ganache is a ganache that throughout its shelf life, which should be well determined in advance, will give you the exact same pleasure from the first day you present it in a counter until the last day of its shelf life. Something we'll surely debate later on in this podcast, but that guarantee of freshness is really key to me. Le premier jour, c'est quelque chose qui doit être garanti, qu'on puisse garantir au client. Those are very interesting points. That sounds like you have quite similar vision, yet a little bit of an individual point of view on that. You're both quite experienced chefs and have been working with Ganache for quite some time. Where do your vision around Ganache come from? Is it because you've experienced that ganaches are a struggle for many chefs? Or is it rather because you see the need for chefs to bring something new and different to the market? Yes, that's a very good question, uh, Dimitri. You know that uh, like 15 years ago, or even even a little bit uh, more, I had a chance, you know, to start uh, a part of my career, you know, at uh, Calabot and working with uh, chef. Uh, one one person that uh, touched me a lot at the time was uh, Jean-Pierre Wibo. I learned a lot uh, from uh, from him. And when I joined, basically, you know, the company, I thought I knew a lot about uh, chocolates. And during the years, I realized that I was uh, really poor on uh, knowledge. I was missing a lot of uh, information. And this is exactly what I felt, you know, during those years uh, that we receive a lot of, uh, you know, phone call from customers emails and so on, ah, I got this problem, I have a debt, how come, why this happened, and this and so on. So I think, you know, uh, the world of a ganache, it's a world which is uh, very uh, complete, concrete, but a world that requests a lot of know-how and knowledge. This is very important. So I really deep dive into this uh, uh, this world, and I found uh, so many uh, things. I learned so many things, you know. And you know, I always said uh, during my classes, you know, uh, for me the chocolates, you know, and the world of ganache, it's a, it's it's like a Bible, a big open book where. Each one of us, you know, can write down, you know, a page, a chapter, you know, uh, to uh, to to help, you know, to make grow. It's a book that will never uh, be closed because we are discovering, you know, every year's uh, new uh, things, new tendency, uh, so on and so on. Alors, ma nouvelle vision sur euh, sur la ganache. Well, to explain my vision around ganaches, I have to take you back to my first steps in the profession. Um, I was employed in chocolatey kitchens and worked a lot with ganaches. From there, I moved on to the Chocolate Academy in Russia. And during the masterclass I was teaching there, many of our customers asked me about ganaches and, and more specifically about how to store them. Now, I found myself repeating the same traditional answers time and time again. 
So it triggered me at a certain point. Something essential in my answers was missing. So I started deep diving into the topic. What is the real definition of a ganache? Why can you make it in so many different ways? And, and how different are the results? I met new people, came to new insights, and I really owe it to our customers. Their questions made me realize we had to have a better understanding of ganaches to help and service them better with the development of products for their shop or their market. So in my book, Neo Cacao, I explain my new vision on ganache. And it is based on the experiences I have with customers I meet every day in the Chocolate Academy. That vision is ultimately based on the problems of the chef chocolatier who makes ganaches every day and who has very specific requirements. For instance, I want this type of bonbon that remains perfect for a certain period of time. Understanding their requirements and giving them the simplest and clearest possible solutions, that's really my aim. Because it helps our customers bring this into reality and develop their business or market. Donc, il puisse se développer son marché et son entreprise. What will tomorrow's ganaches look like? Okay, chef, thank you both. On your website and in your publication, you both focus on what you call modern ganaches. Explain to me what, what's different in this modern approach to ganaches compared to what generations before us have done. Why does it really matter? Alors je dirais euh, moderne, je dirais la ganache d'aujourd'hui. Well, instead of talking about modern ganaches, I would rather focus on today's ganaches. So what's so different today compared to the traditional ganache? Well, before, many chocolatiers relied on their feeling, I'd, I'd almost say gut feel, when they were making their ganaches, and not necessarily on something that is scientifically proven. In a modern approach, a ganache both unites the chocolatier's personality and character, but also his understanding of what is going on inside that ganache, technically and scientifically. So today's ganaches can be explained. It's still based on the ancestral tradition. Don't forget, chocolatiers 100 years ago perfectly knew what they were doing, but understanding and explaining the science behind it is key today. Well, when we talk about uh, modern uh, ganache, you know, today I think that we can do uh, ganaches with uh, 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 every ingredient uh, of the world. You know that uh, uh, in after 2000, you know, the world of uh, uh, spices, uh, foods coming from all around the world, you know, uh, is really open. So, of course, you know, we are uh, starting, you know, to play with those uh, amazing uh, ingredients uh, uh, coming from, uh, uh, from Asia, from America. America and so on, you know, to have a very interesting uh, product, um, uh, which we were not, you know, doing uh, maybe in the past. We were maybe a little bit uh, more classic, classic flavors uh, and so on. So uh, it was maybe requesting, uh, let's say, uh, less, uh, I would say not less knowledge, but uh, less involvement on the recipe uh, development uh, before. Now, if you go to a chocolatier and you say, well, I would like, you know, to have, you know, a, a beautiful ganache, you know, combined with uh, hazelnut and use uh, hazelnut and yuzu, for instance, something like that. I think, you know, that the, the chocolatier will look at you and say, what is he asking for? You know, why is he asking, you know, this kind of uh, combination? And I can tell you that this combination is just a perfect and an amazing combination. But you need to understand what you are combining together. A very uh, easy example here, we have a fruit which has a certain acidity, okay? And in another hand, we have a product which contains a lot of fat. So by combining, you know, those two ingredients together, we need to respect, you know, some parameters. And this is what, you know, makes, you know, today uh, a ganache a little bit uh, uh, modern uh, for me, that it's the uh, ability, you know, uh, to be able to formulate a recipe and have, at the end, the perfect taste, texture and structure. Now, let's look ahead. What will ganache look like in 10 years from now? How do you think ganache will change or evolve? And in extension, how will the entire profession of chocolatier change? 
what will the future bring? Well, um, uh, Dimitri, you know that we are, uh, you know, following a lot of uh, trends, you know, on the on the market. Uh, the past, I would say, the past uh, ten years, you know, it's a lot about uh, uh, the less sugar, about uh, uh, the less fat, uh, about uh, vegan, about all this uh, tendency free from. Uh, we have also allergies, you know. They were not. I won't say they were not existing, but uh, today they are uh, way more, uh, you know, present, you know. In in the world we need you know as chocolatier to adapt to all of this so we need to also uh, bring a solution uh, to uh, our customer so uh, for me you know uh, a ganache or chocolates you know a small chocolate small bonbon uh, will always remain you know a, a real uh, pleasure so we need to keep you know the beautiful and the classics but we uh, today, not tomorrow, today, uh, must we must be able to answer also the question for the people that are looking for vegan, free from allergies and so on. Interesting. We've touched multiple things that are really matter in a ganache. The taste, the texture, the chef life. Let's have a look at the different items and let's start with taste. How to bring out the natural flavors in a ganache. Wilfried, um, you mentioned that customer will expect more freshness, authentic and natural flavor from bonbon, and in ganache in particular. Now, if you want to achieve that in a recipe, where do you start as a chocolatier? What are the key things to look at? Alors pour obtenir une ganache euh, avec beaucoup de fraîcheur et d'authenticité. Well, to answer this question, you have to imagine that each chocolaterie business is different. Every chocolatier has very specific requirements. So before starting to think about a recipe, the first thing to do really is start from the last part. Define first where you want to sell to whom you want to sell. If you decide that your bonbons need to have a shelf life of 30 days in your counter, it will define everything. The way you will produce your ganache, the recipe and your choice of ingredients. So if now you would want to create a ganache with a lot of freshness and authenticity, I'd recommend to start from clearly defined products. For a ganache, you start with the chocolate. Cacao Berry, for instance, offers a range of chocolate with an expressive taste and a natural character. Now, to personalize it, you might consider adding fruits. And that's where I believe that the future is not in extracts or polyols sugars, nor in flavoring agents. It will be in pure ingredients, fresh fruits, fresh dairy and chocolate. Now, to finally get there, the chocolatier will have to make the right ingredient choices and formulate the recipes respecting the unique properties of the ingredients he or she has chosen. Now, you also have to understand the reason why you've chosen a specific chocolate, for instance. Suppose you would opt for a chocolate with aromatic notes of lemon and rum. You have to be aware that over time, those notes will be dispersed in your ganache and will even fade over time. In industrial production, it is common practice to work with flavoring agents, but for us, as artisans, it is key to maintain those standards of freshness and naturalness. And that also means accepting they're limited in time. Now, let's bring that into a practical example. Suppose you have a wonderful chocolate, like Cacao Barrier Rigoso, as a starting point of your ganache. It has a very mild, creamy, herbal and woody notes. How would you start to get this flavor pop up in your ganache? What would you do? And more specifically, what would you not do? Rugoso is a real exceptional chocolate because of the very aromatic and powerful notes it brings. And to make its flavor stand out, I would work it into a ganache for enrobing. So a ganache to be cut and dipped afterwards. It allows you to really work on the texture of the ganache while keeping it really simple. The reason why I would not prefer to work this chocolate into a ganache for molding has to do with the composition of the chocolate. It contains 42% cocoa butter and 61% of cocoa solids. That means you'd have to add a large quantity of water or butter to the ganache recipe to arrive to smooth fluid texture. 
And that wouldn't be my preferred choice. That's the reason why in this case I would choose for a ganache for enrobing. Now, to preserve the flavor notes of Rigoso in your ganache, I would recommend to create a ganache that contains less fats and is actually made with a water base. The water base can help you to create a really smooth textured ganache and with less fats added, you will have the pure taste of Rugoso really come out. I would rather be on the utilization of Rugoso on a bonbon trempé. Okay, and uh, let's take it another step further, Wilfried. It's so often said that creams and butters tend to smoother the natural flavor of fruit and chocolate. So suppose you would want to make a fully plant-based ganache with the same Rugoso chocolate from Coco Berry. Would that work? And how would you replace the cream and butter, for instance? Donc, vous avez tout à fait raison, le, la crème et le beurre... You're absolutely right, uh, Wilfried. Cream and butter can really smother or camouflage certain flavors, also the taste of chocolate. What I would recommend is to start your ganache recipe from a syrup base made with uh, water and starches of rice and tapioca. What you do is really reproducing the texture of cream, but on a water basis, without adding fats, incorporating that into your chocolate ganache would turn it into a fully plant-based ganache without butter, yet with all the smoothness butter would bring. Donc, qui contient sans sans beurre en fait, mais qui a toute l'onctuosité du beurre. Wilfred, many chocolatiers experience with fruit and fruit purees in a ganache to support the idea of freshness and natural fruit flavor. In your book Neo Cacao and in the guiding videos, you're quite explicit that this to you no longer qualify as a ganache. Can you explain why? Alors pour ça, pour répondre à cette question... Yes, that's true. Uh, but to answer this question, let me go back to the definition of a ganache. If in a ganache, chocolate is your main flavor and you would add some raspberry or pink peppercorn to elevate the taste, I'm perfectly okay with this being a ganache. But if fruit puree is your main ingredient, then that means your ganache between brackets will have a lot of water and a lot of sugars to bind all that water. And eventually you then stabilize it with chocolate. Well, that to me no longer qualifies as a ganache. Then we're talking about a sugar confectioning. That's what I'm trying to explain in my book, Neo Cacao. How to minimize the use of sugars in a ganache. Another big topic you've both been touching, Alexander and Wilfred, uh, is the use of sugar, sugar syrups, and polyol sugar in a ganache. Let's start with you, Alexander. What do sugar actually do in a ganache? Well, this is always a very uh, touchy, you know, point because uh, everywhere I traveled, you know, sugars, it's always, let's say, uh, a big question. Why all these sugars? Why, why are you using, you know, uh, those uh, alternative sugars and so on? So I will try, you know, uh, to, uh, to give you, let's say, a brief answer because it would take, you know, hours and hours to uh, complete the answer. But I will try yes. to, uh, to summarize, you know, uh, uh, this uh, question. So first of all, let's not forget that sugars you know uh, the first rule of sugars is to bring sweetness you know to the to the product so if i add you know sugar into a ganache it's because you know at the end you know the rule of it you know is to bring me uh, 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 some sweetness of course uh, the sugars will have a direct impact on the structure of your ganache so let's make it simple more sugar you will add into your ganache softer will uh, become your ganache it's very difficult you know to have a ganache which is very very sweet and at the same time hard because sugar you know as per rules has a tendency to soften you know the structure of uh, the the ganache but the most important thing the reason why we use uh, an especially different uh, sugar combine okay is to helping to prevent uh, growth of microorganisms you know by binding free water so let's make it uh, uh, very short you know in a ganache you know there is always a certain amount of uh, water a part of this water it's already binded you know by uh, you know uh, the different uh, uh, composition of the ganache uh, but by the sugar a, pa the, a part of this water it's what we call the free water so it's a water that 
could, you know, move into your ganache, uh, disappear from uh, your ganache, uh, getting out of the ganache, and could, you know, uh, create some issue. And we're going to talk it. Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, uh, of course, uh, later. So the real rules of the sugar is to bind as much as we can this free water to keep the perfect composition, structure, and taste of the ganache. Now, if we dig in this a bit deeper into the sugar, if consumers want natural less, less sugar, how as a chocolatier can you reduce the use of sugar in a ganache? And what do you recommend, Alexandre? Oh, that's a, it's a it's a very interesting question, and I believe you know that it's a very uh, trendy point you know at the, the moment. We need to divide you know that uh, answer uh, uh, for me in a different uh, uh, let's say a different phrase. Um, if we talk about uh, the sweetness itself of a ganache, uh, Dimitri, uh, then we can use you know uh, what I call uh, technological sugars. Okay, there are alternatives. There are sugars that are uh, less uh, sweet sugars and polyalcohol eh? you mentioned about it before mm -hmm. so when we talk about sugars you know we can have a, a dextrose or glucose syrup you know those type of sugar as um, a sweetness uh, index level which is lower uh, than the saccharose, the classic uh, sugar. So at the end, your product, okay, will have uh, basically uh, less uh, sweet uh, sweetener level of your product. So this is one. Uh, if we talk about the glycemic impact, uh, for the, for instance, the the people that have uh, uh, problems, you know, uh, diabetes and so on, uh, mm -hmm. then we need to play uh, between brackets uh, with uh, alternative uh, sugar that can be a uh, maltitol. It can be a stevia uh, and and so on. One of the sugar uh, now that uh, very uh, few people knows are the uh, fructo oligosaccharide. Uh, saccharide in English, I think, or saccharide, I don't know, <laughs> but I think you uh, understand. <laughs> To make it yes. simple, uh, Dimitri, we are uh, talking about, uh, let's say, fibers coming from uh, coming from the from the, the nature. And one uh, of the uh, the fiber that it's used uh, today, okay, it's the inner inulin. Inulin, you know, uh, yes. it's uh, ex extracted uh, from the the chicory. Okay, yes, uh, glycemic index uh, very very low, and you know, uh, people suffering, you know, from certain you know disease and so on, you know, can you know uh, accept you know this uh, uh, this uh, this type of uh, of uh, product. So there are existing. Uh, alternatives you know to uh, all these uh, uh, sugars pay attention this is not a revolution this is not something that uh, will replace completely you know uh, the other type of sugars but it brings some solution so i'm talking about uh, inulin and uh, oligo fructose for instance wilfried well, what will be your view on this can you for instance make a ganache without using sugar and if so, how will you create your recipe? Alors, mon point de vue sur euh, sur le sucre dans une. Euh, well, dans une... my point of view is yes, yes, it is perfectly possible to make a ganache without sugar. It's necessary to understand that the chocolate we use for our ganache already contains sugar, but when it's integrated in the ganache, it does not help me in the conservation of the ganache. So for ganaches that require long shelf life, you'd need to add sugars like saccharose or polyols. And now for me, that's a big watch out. Simply because for instance, polyols are not always well understood and sometimes even dosed in wrong quantities. For industrial production, very often these products are added under strict control and after research. Today, in our business, very often sugar mixes such as dextrose, sorbitol, glycerol, inulin are added to a ganache and in quite considerate proportions. But the truth is, we don't always know what we're doing. Your first impression might be that these sugar mixes create a less sweet taste sensation, but for our body, sugar remains sugar. It's that simple. Secondly, 
if all food companies start to use these types of sugars, it could drastically increase our polio intake on a full day, without us even being able to calculate our intake or be aware of it. So at the end of the day, we might end up with digestion problems caused by the things we ate, or better, because of the accumulation of our polio intake and other sugars over the day. So I highly recommend ganaches in which no sugar is added. To achieve that, I work with chocolate or cocoa liquors, which are defatted and of which the sugar is extracted and incorporated into the water-based syrup. That way, I end up with a ganache that has a chocolate content of 70%. It's like a chocolate bar, but then creamy and super smooth. Like a ganache, like a tablet of chocolate, but it's creamy. How to achieve perfect smoothness in a ganache? Now, let's look at texture. Tell me if you agree or not, but a ganache is supposed to have a velvety, smooth texture in contrast with a perfectly snappy chocolate shell, right? How will you define that smoothness? What should it be like? What's your ideal standard? Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a good point, you know, it's something that we repeat uh, from years and this is something also that uh, our customers are looking for. Maybe unconsciously, you know, they, they are not uh, uh, basically knowing, but it's just the, 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 the pleasure. So we need to make a difference because sometimes there is a confusion between texture and structure. Structure, it's really, you know, the way how the ganache will stand, you know, and this is mostly coming from the, the fat. When we talk about the texture, we talk more about the mouth feel, the melting behavior of your uh, ganache. So basically, you know, when uh, you eat a ganache, you know, w the, the, the best uh, pleasure it's uh, to eat, to have a bite, you know, and then the melting, it's coming quite, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, smoothly, eh? uh, uh, not too fast, okay, but not uh, uh, that it doesn't take too long uh, as well. So uh, in order to have that Dimitri, it's um, again, you know, uh, to talk about, you know, the combination of the different uh, ingredients. So I will give you a, a very easy example. For instance, if you formulate a recipe based on a dark chocolate ganache, you know, in the dark chocolate, you know, contains a, a dry cocoa solid or what we call the cocoa fibers. Uh, the dry cocoa solid has always a tendency to dry out your ganache. It means that more cocoa solid you have into your ganache, drier will become your ganache. So if you put too much of this uh, chocolate, which contain a lot of fibers, you will have a ganache, okay, which will have a bad uh, mouth feel. Why? Because you have too much of this uh, fiber and the melting behavior won't be uh, uh, a good one. Uh, same thing if you use uh, too much uh, uh, a milk chocolate that contain too much uh, milk powder, milk powder, uh, more milk powder equal more lactose, okay? More lactose can bring in the, uh, let's say, uh, in, the, in, the, in the time, you know, um, a, a bad uh, melting behavior. Why? Because the lactose will recrystallize and this is what we call, let's say, a sandy uh, texture. Um, so one of the points that I used, for instance, in uh, my ganache, you know, to F, because your question was about the texture, uh, it's mm -hmm. about playing with the different uh, fat. Uh, when I talk, I don't like this word fat, but let's talk, let's say, about uh, butter. You know, there are different butter. If we take the, the classic butter, we think about 82% uh, 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 fat uh, butter content. But in the market, you know, uh, it exists uh, butter, what we call uh, anhydrous butter which does not contain uh, any water so they are pure butter and a certain company in the world of butter have created butter with different different uh, melting temperature and this is really interesting why because by using a butter that has uh, let's say a lower melting temperature 
this can change completely you know the mouth feel of uh, of your hand ganache so this is also i would say you know one of the ingredients that could have a nice uh, interest and impact you know to have uh, let's say a perfect uh, creaminess uh, uh, of, uh, of a ganache alors pour euh, avoir un, un bonbon euh, pour moi idéal donc euh, je suis d'accord euh, le But to have an ideal bonbon, I agree that the chocolate shell must be perfectly snappy and the inside must be smooth and creamy. Looking at ganaches from a traditional point of view, one would say that the smoothness or creaminess comes from the water inside the recipe and from the fat, mostly butter, added to the ganache. Now I think, or better, I know for sure, after our research, what causes a rigid or hard texture in a ganache that needs smoothing afterwards with butter. And that is when it, the cocoa solids in a ganache get in contact with water, they will first absorb the water, leading to a dry and hard texture. So logically, you would add butter to soften it and to make it creamy. But what we found is that adding those fats is not necessary. In our book Neo Cacao, we describe that by creating a specific syrup, you can prevent the cocoa solids from soaking up all the water. So the cocoa solids remain suspended in that syrup solution, and the end result is a really creamy ganache without any added butter or fat. Because in fact, the matter is in suspension now in the ganache. Now, what is the secret to that smooth texture? Is it the ingredients? Is it the processing? What's your experience? Absolutely, Dimitri. And this is, you touch a very important uh, point, you know. It's not, about, you know, the world of ganache, it's not uh, only about, uh, let's say, uh, ingredient or about processing or about uh, machinery or about temperature or about humidity. It's about all of this together. And this is what, you know, uh, the most important, you know, thing is uh, uh, to be able to combine Uh, all these elements together to get the, the perfect uh, result. So, for instance, you know, the working process of your uh, ganache, you know, the stability of the emulsion. Uh, of course, if you uh, make a ganache, uh, you know, exactly the same recipe with a whisk, or if you use, for instance, uh, Stefan machine, uh, for instance, which is a very mm -hmm. professional machinery, you will have two complete different results. The recipe is the same, but the process is is uh, different. So this is very important when we talk about the working process, about the machinery and also about uh, the, the ingredient, the freshness of uh, the, the ingredient. Uh, it's impossible to make a good ganache if your basic ingredients are not good ingredients. Uh, this mm. seems logic, but you know, Sometimes it's not uh, logic for uh, for everyone because if you do not have you know a, a, a good well refined chocolate, it's very difficult afterwards you know to get a perfect smooth uh, ganache. So those elements are very important. But again, Dimitri, for me, uh, one key point it's about uh, the recipe formulation and therefore know-how and knowledge about ingredients. Alors dans la ganache dite traditionnelle, euh, well, in a traditional ganache, it's both actually. When preparing a ganache, the more you heat ingredients, the more the fats will melt, the more the dry ingredients will be liberated, and the more those dry solids will absorb the water. So you get a harder, drier ganache as an end result. Now, if you would create a ganache at a lower temperature, where the cocoa butter does not liberate all the dry solids, you will end up with a more creamy ganache. The conservation of products using these two different techniques would also be entirely different. In the last case, there's a lot of water which hasn't been absorbed by the dry solids, leading to a short shelf life. In the first case, where we elaborate the ganache at high temperature, where the dry solids absorb all water, you will have a more stable, longer shelf life, but a drier and a harder texture. So to solve this, everything is really important. The kind of ingredients you combine, but also the order in which you combine the ingredients. In my experience, it's best to bind free water into the ganache, 
You can do that with a syrup base, which can be fatty as well. It will be incorporated into the chocolate that is melted at 50 degrees Celsius, but the water in the syrup itself is already perfectly bound and it will not be absorbed by the dry solids in the ganache. And that will lead to creamy, smooth texture. Une texture crémeuse et lisse. Okay, let's suppose now you will want to reduce ingredients such as cream or butter, or even leave them out. How will you create a recipe that has a beautifully balanced, smooth texture? Well, I mean, it's uh, it's totally uh, possible. And during my uh, classes, you know, when I do this uh, ganache formulation uh, classes, we do, you know, such uh, ganache. You know, when we, for instance, when we do a vegan ganache, we we are not uh, able, of course, to use a dairy product, a butter, cream, and so on. So. You know, there are alternatives. Huh? You can use uh, uh, a water, you can use syrup, you can use uh, a fruit puree, you can uh, use uh, uh, soya milk, you can use uh, almond milk. All kind of these products are possible. When we talk about the fat, uh, you know, uh, there are also different fat that you can uh, that you can uh, use, like uh, coconut, uh, coconut oil, different type of oil. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, grape seeds oil, for instance, and so on, which are are also very interesting in terms uh, of uh, texture. We we're just talking about the texture before, and um, uh, oil are uh, uh, very interesting. Of course, you know, balancing you know uh, properly the recipe uh, into it. But another ingredient that we did not touch about it, you know, uh, are like for instance nut paste. Huh? Uh, everything mm -hmm. made out of uh, hazelnut, uh, almond, pistachio, uh, and so on. Okay. Now we know how we can optimize taste and create smooth texture. Let's now look at another important feature of ganaches, the chef life. How to maximize the shelf life of your ganaches. Chef life of a ganache is probably one of the most discussed items among chefs around the world, enlightenment chefs. How important is chef life for an artisan chocolatier. And what are we talking about here? Are we talking about two weeks, two months, six months? What's your experience? Well, you are completely right, uh, Dimitri. This is a big topic, you know, and this is a topic, you know, the past uh, the past 15 years, you know, I've been uh, traveling around the world, you know, and at the end to talk about uh, shelf life uh, of uh, of ganache. And until today, the people call me for that. So, which makes, uh, you know, uh, me very happy that we can talk about it. So, let's try uh, to summarize uh, here. Um, when we talk about shelf life, uh, what I realize, it depends from countries to countries. Um, for instance, uh, in Belgium, you know, uh, which is, uh, you know, a chocolate uh, country, we eat chocolate uh, throughout the year. Uh, so it means uh, that, you know, a chocolatier is open uh, 365 days a year. Then uh, what does it mean? That he can produce, you know, on a daily uh, basis his uh, product. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, to uh, create, uh, to uh, produce uh, chocolate with uh, extremely long shelf life because if he has a good rotation, he doesn't need uh, to do it. But other countries, when you go, for instance, to a country which is uh, warmer, like uh, uh, south of Italy, Spain, and so on, most of uh, the people uh, ask me this question. Uh, is it possible to uh, make ganache recipe and keep them for six months or more. And I always ask why you want to do that. And they basically tell me, well, because we have the season where, where we uh, uh, sell, you know, those ganache and afterwards, you know, come, you know, the hot weather. So so we try to make one uh, one full production. Okay, we keep the six ones, and we are happy about uh, about uh, this one. So this is uh, something that uh, uh, again I repeat, it depends from uh, country to country, but also from chef to chef. Some people, you know, some chef they say, you know, me, I don't want to use uh, any additives. I don't want to use uh, uh, any uh, extra uh, product, you know, to uh, conserve my gosh. I look I, I i'm looking for very fresh ganache and i'm not interested on that and i always say respect this is a great point but be careful you know about what you also sell to your customer make sure at least that your product uh, is uh, is stable 
Again, uh, that's what I uh, mentioned before. If he has know-how, uh, knowledge about the ingredients, you know, he should be able, you know, to stabilize uh, uh, those ganache. So, if you your question was about uh, two weeks, two months, and six months, I will. My answer will be: It depends for whom, for what kind, for an artisan. I would say. It doesn't need to have more than a two to maximum uh, three months uh, shelf life. Let's make good and fresh products. Let's leave, uh, let's say, long shelf life, you know, nine months, one year to industry. We are artisan and we want to make nice and fresh products. Alors, tous les jours, je côtoie des, euh, des entreprises qui sont totalement différentes. Shelf life can be completely different for every business, really. Technically, it's, it's perfectly possible to create a bonbon with a ganache that has a shelf life of two weeks to six months. A professional needs to make that choice, and that choice is driven by the cost of the bonbon or the taste experience you want to give to your customer. To give you an example, if you'd consider making a bonbon with cognac in the recipe, for instance, you could envisage a shelf life of two weeks to two months. Now, if you would stretch it beyond two months, you need to be aware that the alcohol inside the cognac, which is a natural product, will evaporate over time. And that causes free water inside the bonbon, which will separate from the sugars. The sugars will recrystallize, which changes the taste and texture experience already after weeks. So you will not have the same products after two months. For me, as an artisan, you should focus on a stable shelf life of two months in the counter. Luckily today, there are also other techniques such as freezing, allowing you to produce sufficient volumes of your ganache bonbons at once and offer freshness to the customer at all times. Pour poser aux clients euh, voilà, au bon moment, voilà ce que je veux, je veux dire. Fully agree, fully agree. Um, I also don't think uh... You could have the same texture, would you, if you were to create a bonbon for a two months shelf life, let's say, uh, compared to a bonbon that would be a six month shelf life? No, absolutely not. Huh? Uh, this will uh, this will change. And you know, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, the the shelf life, Dimitri, I mean, we are not talking only about you know the fact that the product it's not uh, uh, start to create uh, uh, fungi, microorganisms, and so on. No, mm -hmm. shelf life. You know, it's uh, you know when a product, uh, when the, the 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 taste, the texture of the product, it's still uh, let's say good. You know, if you uh, um, announce me for instance uh, 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 I would say hazelnut uh, ganache you know after two months or three months whatever it is uh, you know it mm -hmm. still need to taste a good fresh taste of uh, uh, hazelnut so this is uh, the point because you can have uh, a ganache that can last for six months between brackets uh, without have any uh, microorganisms organism growth but the taste is not good. And guys, let's not forget, yeah. you know, what we expect. I mentioned it before. It's pleasure. It's a, a great moment uh, that we want. It's taste, simple as that. So we as artisans, as a rule uh, to play, uh, is what I just say, bring pleasure to our customer. So let's keep on fresh ganache as much as we can. Now, what determines the chef life of a ganache? Is it again the ingredients? the processing techniques or both Dimitri it's uh, this is uh, it's a combination not only about ingredient and process but also equipment also about cooling way also about storage also about hygiene also about humidity about temperature about working condition so here i mention you I think uh, uh, nine to ten different points. And again, you know, a ganache is an emulsion, okay? The success of a ganache is to put in emulsion all what I just told you. Donc en fait, uh, well, there's many factors that will determine the shelf life of a ganache. You're absolutely right, the choice of ingredients in the first place. But even more important, the order of incorporating the ingredients will play a crucial role. And then there's the temperature. If you heat to 50 degrees Celsius, it will give you a different shelf life. 
And then there's the equipment, for instance, uh, you use during the manufacturing process. There's a big difference in results when you would be using a whisk or a machine that can make 10,000 rotations per minute. And then there's the general hygiene or the humidity and temperature in your working environment, the cooling of your storage. They all will determine the water activity in your bonbons and eventually the shelf life of your product. Right, I get it. Now, hearing you and also knowing consumer wants less sugar, less processed ingredients and more freshness, how can you extend the chef life of ganache using less sugars or alcohol? What are our options? To extend the shelf life of your ganache in a natural way, so that means without using additives in the recipe, we did some tests that we describe in our book Neo Cacao. The best way is to extract the sugar from the chocolate and incorporate it into a syrup. The advantage is that those sugars will bind with the water in the syrup, which can still be based on a fruit puree, milk or cream, but we're using those sugars to saturate the water in the syrup. And that technique will help you to create a bonbon with a longer shelf life without adding any sugars. Augmenter la conservation du bonbon sans rajouter de, de sucre en plus de ça. Yes, so um, they are um, okay. Sugars we we talked about it. Um, mm. Alternative sugars I mentioned uh, before about uh, about it, but they are also uh, the use of uh, uh, different uh, technologies, uh, technologies that could uh, help you know to uh, extend the the shelf life of, of a ganache so i will give you an example um, if you make uh, the same recipe and you will do uh, this recipe with a, a whisk you know just uh, by uh, yeah. uh, stirring you know with a whisk uh, uh, the same recipe you will uh, use a hands blender the same recipe you will use a, a stefan uh, and then you will uh, the next one you will use a, a modify uh, atmosphere okay so the same recipe uh, in four different way of uh, processing okay i could have i put it like that you know the first one can last maybe for three weeks the second one maybe for one month and the last one maybe can last for three months the same recipe so Again, you know, it's uh, about, uh, you know, uh, the process, uh, the technology that uh, that we have now. And this is, you know, um, uh, your question at the beginning of uh, our podcast was about, you know, what makes also a modern uh, ganache? What makes also a modern ganache? It's also the use of the different uh, uh, technology, the use of the different technology to get, you know, I would say to the perfect, uh, the perfect taste, the perfect uh, uh, ganache. Then after, uh, and I mentioned uh, also before alternative sugars like uh, fibers, uh, inulin, inulin and so on, could, uh, could uh, help, uh, of course. You mentioned freezing. Um, that's something we've heard about in our profession. What would you suggest? Would you suggest freezing a uh, finished bobo? Or are we talking about the casted ganache that are ready to be enrolled? Which option do you think is best? Yes, Dimitri, absolutely. And there's uh, also a question that uh, it's raised uh, many often, you know, very often, sorry, uh, during my classes uh, to freeze ganache. So there are two options, like you mentioned. We can either freeze the ganache before enrobing, okay? Or we can freeze, uh, let's say, the finished uh, the finished product. So let's talk about uh, first the ganache, uh, non-enrobed uh, uh, ganache. The important thing, Dimitri, uh, what we need to pay attention, that the ganache, it's uh, already set before uh, freezing. What do I mean? When you make uh, a ganache, you know, you have this uh, perfect emulsion and you will, uh, let's say, uh, place this ganache uh, into a ganache ganache frame. It's important that uh, this ganache uh, set before you freeze. Why? Because you allow the uh, dry uh, solids and the sugars, you know, 
to absorb, you know, uh, to be absorbed, sorry, by the water. This is when the ganache is set. It's set. So when it's set at this time, what I recommend is to cut, you know, your ganache huh, with, a, with a guitar. Mm -hmm. You place them on trays and then it's very important to wrap them properly uh, with uh, a plastic uh, cling film, uh, for instance, um, that it uh, you avoid any contact, you know, with the freezer uh, air, uh, the air of the the freezer, to avoid uh, any water droplet. So this is one solution. The second solution is to unrope your bonbon when they are finished, uh, and the bonbon it's also the chocolate that cover it's crystallized, you know. Uh, my recommendation is to place them into uh, blisters, uh, already blisters, okay, already in the box, and then you freeze the chocolate already in the box. Why? Because it will make your life very easy afterwards, you know, to unfreeze them. You will remove the box directly from the freezer, you know, even to the room temperature. And because of, let's say, the protection of the cling film and the, the mm -hmm. box itself, okay, you won't have any water contamination. And this is, let's say, uh, the perfect way. Okay, that being said, now, what would be the best way to defrost your bonbon? How would you go about it? Uh, the, the best way, you know, like uh, the chocolate in uh, general, we always talk about uh, time and temperature. So time is very important. Do not fasten the process. Do not go too fast to avoid, uh, you know, to have this uh, water contamination. So it's a step by step and that's the best way. Maybe from the freezer to a normal fridge, from the normal fridge to the, uh, let's say, the room temperature. It takes uh, a certain amount of uh, time. What is important, you know, that when you uncover completely uh, the ganache or the chocolate, uh, finished uh, product, okay, that the product is as at the same temperature as the room temperature and this won't create uh, any uh, water. One of the things often mentioned when it comes to shelf life of ganache is the AW value or the water activity. Can you explain to us what is it and is it still relevant today? Or would you recommend other parameters to look into? Alors, le AW c'est quelque chose d'assez compliqué. The AW value of your ganache is rather complicated since most artisans don't have the equipment to measure it. On top, there's different models of measuring the AW value and not all are as interesting to understand what the impact is on shelf life. There are, for instance, machines on the market that keep your ganache at a certain temperature to measure the water activity in your ganache at that specific moment. Those machines will give you a value between zero and one, but that number is just an interpretation at that very specific moment. Uh, let me clarify this. I mean, the AW value you get is like a photograph. It is only valid at that very specific moment. It doesn't take the environmental factors into account that might change your ganache over time. For instance, high humidity, or temperature rises and drops in your storage, all those factors may change the water activity in your ganache. You could compare it to a piece of wood. Wood will absorb humidity in humid conditions, and it will get dry once humidity goes down again. Exactly that also happens to your ganache. So those factors will change the water activity in your ganache every day. And by consequence, they will change the way sugars and fats behave in your ganache. So my recommendation is, don't measure the AW value of your ganache, because it's not really reliable, but measure the AW value of the syrup that you will incorporate in a ganache instead. By doing so, you will have a reliable, stable value and a real indication of the water activity. Once you've incorporated the syrup in the chocolate, dry solids in the chocolate will absorb the water, but they will release water and absorb water again based on changes in the environment. So to have a reliable value, always measure the AW value of your syrup and not the AW value of your ganache. And if I will reduce sugar and processed ingredients, can technology or equipment help me to maximize the shelf life of my ganaches? What would you recommend? 
Alors si nous partons sur euh, une ganache. Well, in traditional ganaches, heating the ganache more will melt the fats in the chocolate. The fats will release all dry solids and more dry solids will bind with water. And that will allow you to stretch shelf life longer. But one thing is even more important. I already said that a ganache is not an emulsion. When your ganache is quite hot, you only have the impression that you end up with an emulsion where water and fats are bound together. But once cooling starts, the emulsion breaks down again. So the ganache will turn into a suspension instead of an emulsion. Now, our aim as chocolatiers is to maintain a stable suspension of dry solids in the ganache as long as possible during cooling. That means until it's at least 31 degrees Celsius or even lower. The best way to achieve that stability is by crystallizing your ganache. For instance, by adding a small part of tempered chocolate or about 1% of tempered cocoa butter on the entire recipe. It will help the ganache to crystallize and to stabilize the dispersion of the dry solids in the ganache. And that is the secret to extending shelf life and have a more stable product. That is really essential. Poor crystallization and poor cooling will make the dry solids and fats to separate again. The solids will sink to the bottom, the fats will rise to the top and the water molecules will regroup again. And that separation will speed up the deterioration of your product. So applying the right processing technique uh, when making your ganache really is important to stretch the shelf life of your product. Après aussi la création de la, de la ganache. Now, suppose I'll be starting my chocolate business and I have to watch my budget and my cost. What would you recommend for me to do to control the chef life and create a beautiful balanced recipe? What will be the first steps to take? Alors, moi, je pense que euh, je, ça va être une, une réponse assez surprenante. Well, this may sound a bit controversial, but I always recommend to spend less time on figuring out how you can produce large volumes of ganaches and bonbons and how to keep them for longer in your counter, rather focus on how you can sell your products faster instead. The faster you sell, the less you'll be faced with issues around shelf life. <laughs>
simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important thing. We are here talking about the best taste, the best freshness of a uh, ganache. So we are not here talking about uh, shelf life. We are not talking about a recipe that can last for two, three, four, five months. Okay. So make it fresh, beautiful. Okay. And focus on taste, respect of the ingredient and the process to make uh, this uh, ganache. Uh, Ingredients, uh, there are some rules on combining uh, ingredients. Don't combine everything together that at the end you have like uh, tricky uh, flavors. So respect uh, ingredients uh, and you will have uh, the best result. The rest, you know what, is just peanut. <laughs> thank you. Alexandre and uh, Wilfried, um, I want to thank you very much for this uh, very interesting conversation. Dimitri, thank you very much uh, for welcoming me, you know, uh, on this uh, podcast. I'm very proud. Wilfried, thank you uh, very much. And uh, also congratulations on your uh, book, uh, which is uh, very important to have uh, uh, such a, a great book, you know, uh, in the world of uh, chocolate. Thank you, guys, and uh, see you at the World Chocolate Master. Ben, merci à toi, Dimitri, uh, de m'avoir invité. Well, thanks, Dimitri, for having me. And thank you, Alexandre, for this interesting exchange and all the interesting conversations we had before. I mention this because your know-how has helped me quite often in understanding ganaches. And finally, I would like to say one last thing to the contestants of the World Chocolate Masters. You're all entering a very intense new era of preparations for the competition. And all I can say is I wish you the best of luck and I hope to see you really soon in the competition itself. Uh, bon courage à tous et à, à bientôt au concours du World Chocolate Master. Absolutely. Can't wait to see each other over there. Bye, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, Dimitri, Alexandra and Wilfried, thanks very much for this interesting conversation on ganaches. And Dimitri, what are your key takeouts of today's session? Um, I think there's quite a lot of knowledge and expertise that was shared here today. Two visions, similarities, yet some little bits and pieces of differences. What I've learned today is a ganache, of course, it's always about taste, pleasure and the incredible math feel. The use of ingredient from talking to both of you will be key. Of course, technology and techniques now have helped us to create balanced recipe that remain stable over time, or at least for the chef life that the chef chocolate is looking for. And uh, understanding what your customer want and need is crucial to make sure we have a good rotation in selling out. And those I think will be crucial in the future as well and are my key takeaway for today. 